Good morning everybody and uh, welcome to our service this morning. Uh, on behalf of uh, our minister and the session, I give you a warm welcome. Uh, I can't see any uh, newcomers around, so uh, without further ado, I'll just uh, ask you to take notice of the notices that have been uh, uh, in the sheet that was handed out at the start of the service and also that on particularly emphasise that on Wednesday will be our sweet hour of prayer We're at 1.30, so you'll all be invited to the time of prayer. And also, uh, next Sunday, I believe Graham will continue his um, series on one another. So, thank you. Thank you, Keith. I'd like to uh, just draw your attention to one of the notices in the leaflet, uh, Keith, which Keith, Keith alluded to, and that is that this year, for the first time, I'm going to uh, offer some Lenten studies so that from Ash Wednesday for 40 days, uh, if anybody would like them, I will, uh, by, by email, that's the only proviso by email or by text message, uh, I'll be able to send out to those who are interested a short extract from the writings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was born in 1906 and he was executed by the Nazis for his, uh, his uh, preaching against uh, the work of the, the National Socialists in Germany. Uh, so two weeks before the end of the Second World War he was executed. But he has uh, written a book, which I've already alluded to earlier in our series, a book called Life Together. And there's a lot of emphasis on the one another passages there. And so he's challenging the Christians in Germany, and this time it was in an underground seminary that was illegal in Germany. He's challenged them to live as Christians despite what's going on in the, the big world of Germany that they were part of. So I've, I have some extracts from that which uh, I would send out and invite you to read, to reflect and to pray and uh, just thought it might be an exercise worth trying. So if you're interested, email me, text me, grab me after the service and uh, let me know you're interested and I'll make sure you start receiving those on Ash Wednesday. Shall we pray together? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us. We thank you for the freedom we have to come. We thank you for the uh, challenges uh, that enable us to uh, uh, come despite the uh, COVID challenge that's uh, raging in the world, this pandemic. And we pray that you will help us to worship safely before you and protect each other. We thank you again that today is an, a day of no uh, local transmission of the virus in our state. And we pray that you will help those who have uh, medical oversight of the population to continue to be careful and to protect us. Lord, we ask that we might be gathered in worship now and that you will join us uh, together and that we might be uh, to one another what we ought to be through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So the hymn is uh, number 15, let all the world in every corner sing. I'm going to ask you to sing with your masks on. I discovered that New South Wales Presbyterian churches have been singing with their masks on. 54, I beg your pardon. 54, the right words are wrong numbers. If, if I ever get it wrong, it's usually the numbers first. <laughs> All right. So it's uh, it's uh, this uh, lovely hymn. Let all the world in every corner sing.
Please be seated. And since we've already had our prayer of invocation, uh, I'm going to ask Christine to come and speak to us with Young at Heart. Well, good morning from me. I had decided, and those who know me quite a bit will know, understand this totally, that I had decided I was not going to go back to the cinema until virtually every Australian had been vaccinated. I love films and the French Film Festival, which Suzanne and I normally enjoy going to, is coming up again in March. It was cancelled last year, and for us, it's probably cancelled this year. But then my daughter, our oldest daughter, invited me to go with her and her daughters to the cinema on Friday night, and I couldn't refuse. So we went to see Penguin Bloom in the new Palace Cinema in Pentridge. Now, has anyone seen this film? No, so I don't want to spoil it for you. I'll try not to say too much about what happens. We had actually, Graham, it's based on a true story. Graham and I had seen the family who, whose story, story it is um, on... Um, Australian story on the ABC. And it's, I think it sticks fairly well to the facts, but of course they're always dramatised. At the centre is a young mother who became paraplegic. She was on holiday in Thailand with her, in, now wait a minute, I think Bali, with her family. And they'd climbed up a tower and were looking over at the view and the wall she was leaning on collapsed and she became paraplegic. The three boys, when this happens, the three sons are still at primary school. Now I think most, if not all of us now, have friends and relatives who, whether from an accident or some other condition, have had to cope with paraplegia and even more with quadriplegia. We've had the latter happen to a friend and a relative after an accident. It's very, very hard for them and their loved ones. Now this family, the Blooms, struggle with all the usual difficulties. This photograph is of the actual mother, not the dramatised one, with Penguin. I'll come to Penguin in a moment. The mother feels useless, her devoted husband wants to help in any way he can and her mother does too, but they can't do the one thing she really wants, which is to get feeling back in her legs. At one point the grandmother says, I just want to make my little girl better. I think the film portrays well the complexities of the situation. One of the boys, I think it's the oldest, Noah, rescues a baby magpie which has fallen from the nest. Now they name the bird penguin because it's black and white. Well, magpies are usually black and white, but they called this one penguin. He plays a very therapeutic role for the family. And I, well, I'm not sure whether it's a he or a she. Anyway, I take my hat off to the bird trainers in this film. There is some amazing footage. In reality, this penguin becomes devoted to this knitted toy, this knitted monkey and sort of plays with this as if it were another magpie. It's, it's really some of the most light-hearted moments are the magpie and this soft toy playing, to, well, play, playing. Last year, for those of you who like such books, I read one called Grief is the Thing with Feathers. 
a poetic story, which it takes a lot of concentration, but I was glad I read it. It's about a father and two boys. The wife, the mother has died, and this crow comes into their lives and really helps them so much. In the case of the actual family, and this, I don't remember this coming into either Australian story <clears throat> or to the film, but the father actually says, the bird is an answer to prayer, although the, you get no impression in anything I've seen that they are a religious family. This is quoting now from the dad. This is one of the boys with the bird. We did everything we could to try to make Sam's life easier when she finally came home after seven months in hospital. Now, our friend who was in a car accident 34 years ago, she was in hospital for 12 months, but then she, she became quadriplegic. Anyway, the family tried everything, but it was clear we were losing her. I don't pretend we are the most religious family, but in addition to seeking the best medical advice one could, we prayed to anyone who could hear us, begging for help. And then one day, our prayers were answered in the most unexpected way when a tiny, scruffy, injured magpie chick entered our lives. And I think we now, can we have the photograph? This is the actual mother with the magpie chick and her three boys. To come back to the film, each person, and it's true, each person in the family has his or her own his or his own personal difficulties. And the sister and grandmother, the aunt and grandmother, they have their difficulties too, coping with a situation which they never envisaged. Gradually it becomes clear that the oldest son, Noah, blames himself. He was the one who suggested that the family climb the tower. So he feels if he had never suggested it, his mother would never have fallen and mum would have been the way she always was. This is incredibly poignant. Until Noah's mother realises, she had no idea, she had no idea that this was going on in his mind. And finally she confronts him and it's a very strong confrontation and then the relationship is healed and he's able to do things like give her a hug when he leaves for school. Sport plays a special role and for someone who's not into sport, I believe that sport can be incredibly valuable in all sorts of ways, but I'm not going to tell you what sport it is that helps really save this lady and so her family. Incredible love and commitment in the marriage and extended family and friendship circles enables this family to manage as well as anyone possibly can with their changed circumstances. Romantic love would never have been enough. It took committed realistic love on the part of her husband and wider family and I was led to reflect on the committed, sacrificial love of Christ our Saviour who gave his all for us. And so because this has happened to a dear friend and to a dear young relative of ours in Edinburgh, the wife, the husband of one of our cousins actually, I, I really felt very sort of personally involved. And as I look out at all of you, my love and think of other people watching my hope and prayer actually my hope and prayer originally was that none of us would have to confront this but 
God has ways that aren't our ways. So my prayer became that whatever challenges all of us may face, and there will be challenges, and are challenges for many of you, we will find strength in our loving God to remain firm in our commitments to family and friends and to anyone God has still to bring into our life. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Christine. Amanda is going to read us uh, the lesson today. Thank you, Amanda. I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 32. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbour, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Amen. Thank you, Amanda. You will now be waited on for your free will offering. Heavenly Father, we remember that the silver and the gold are yours and the cattle on a thousand hills. So we bring our offerings and we ask that all that we are and all that we have might be to your honour and glory and that this offering might serve the interests of the work and kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, after a reading 
uh, like the one that Amanda has just brought to us, you might be thinking, who is it that is acceptable to God? What is God looking for in us? And this is an old question. It's a question which comes up in Psalm 15, which asks, within thy tabernacle, Lord, that is in God's tent, who shall abide with thee? And in thy high and holy hill, who shall a dweller be? Who can go to God's place and live there with God? It's an interesting question, and the psalm provides an answer. And, of course, the rest of the Bible continues to amplify that. Shall we sing Psalm 15? <coughs> seated. So this is our third uh, in a series of uh, addresses where we're looking at the words one another in the New Testament. And I'm sure by now you've heard me say that the word one another occurs a hundred times in the New Testament. And uh, we, uh, we've, I've grouped them today because a whole lot of these one another references come to, in, under the heading of communication. How should Christian people communicate with one another? There are a lot of verses about this, and you heard some of them, uh, more than one in the passage which Amanda read. You notice that the word alelon was the word. I'm not, not trying to teach you any Greek. I'm not a Greek teacher or not even a Greek scholar, to tell the truth. So... But this word is the word which is, this red word, is the word which uh, in the Greek language is translated uh, into English by two words, either one another or each other, alone. And the, the, the theme that we've, I've grouped uh, the passages together today under is this theme of speaking truth to one another. So we want to discover why this matters. What does the Bible say about our communication, about Christian communication? And why does it matter? Well, we're going to discover that there are some deadly pitfalls, but some beautiful possibilities. So that's uh, the, the range of options. Uh, terrible pitfalls, but beautiful possibilities. I'm going to group, uh, the, as you can see in the leaflet, under three headings. First one is don't eat one another. <laughs> that's a bit grim, isn't it? The second one is don't grumble, don't lie. And the third one is speak truth to one another, build one another up in love. So these are a collection of passages and in the leaflet uh, which uh, you received as you came in or which you can download from the webpage, 
uh, the, passage, the Bible passages are, are alongside the, uh, the references here. So first of all, let's take this one. Don't eat one another. This comes from Galatians chapter 5. And you might remember that the letter to the Galatians is the only letter in which the, the uh, writer Paul does not speak uh, positively about the Galatians. He doesn't congratulate them on the things they're doing well because there is a terrible problem in the, church, in, in the churches of Galatia. Uh, and this strange deception, uh, don't eat one another, it sounds a little bit up to date somehow when you think about the, sta- the status of contemporary debate, political discourse, Some years ago, they brought in rules in the uh, Australian Parliament to govern question time. Why? Because question time was just a time of abusing people and misusing and wasting time. It was terrible to listen to on the radio. And when you heard it, you thought, are these the people we put in Parliament? They're just point scoring the whole time. Uh, Paul's letter is written to a Christian congregation, a struggling congregation, a weak congregation, And he says in chapter 3 of Galatians, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Has somebody cast a spell on you? Have you forgotten that you're accepted by God for Jesus' sake? It's not about how how much of the law you keep. And and in uh, in this letter, he actually says that uh, there was somebody who was saying they needed to keep the Jewish law. In chapter 5, verse 10. And in chapter 3, Paul talks about this issue quite a bit. And the problem is that as soon as you say you have to do this or you have to do that, you start an unending string of things that you have to do. Because somebody's always going to ask you to do a bit more. I remember hearing a man once address a group of 100 or so young people and he uh, attacked the girls in the group because they weren't all wearing hats. Some of them weren't wearing hats. And the way this man thought, you were not doing God's will if you did not wear a hat if you were a woman. And he even said, you may say it's just one man saying this, but it's one man and God. Oh, you see what difficult standards we can set one another. And so here they were saying, well, the Jewish law, which parts of the Jewish law? 400 and more commandments? Uh, how does this all work out? And this led to rivalry within them, within the group. And some were saying one thing and some were saying another. A similar situation it developed in Corinth, you might remember, where there were more than one person who was dissenting. And some were saying, I follow Paul and I follow Apollos. And the apostle says, was Paul crucified for you? Was Christ? Who died for you? It was Christ who died. So the rivalry uh, reminds them that if, if, if you re- revert to that kind of thinking, no one will ever be saved. They had forgotten that they belonged, as we saw last week, to one body. They've all been baptized into Christ Jesus. And Christ, it is Christ who makes us acceptable to the Father. And we must give up the destructive rival groups. So when, by using this expression, don't eat one another, we're reminded that we're feeding some kind of appetite in us. What is it that we're trying to feed when we criticize and condemn other people? Is it some kind of aspiration for self-righteousness? But all our righteousness is in Christ. He is our righteousness. And so we, we need to come back to the cross all the time. What are you feeding? Is it your ego that you feed um, when, you, when you start to critique others? So I, I, I was pleased. I don't know if you caught this news item in the, in the news this week, but uh, there's a, a parish council in Handforth in the United Kingdom. It's a tiny parish council. And... This has apparently gone viral. The world's worst Zoom call is taken the internet by storm. Now, this, this was a meeting which happened on the 10th of December in England. It's a tiny parish. It's not actually a church, I'm relieved to say. I thought at first it was a church parish council, but it's a local administrative area. 
and uh, the Guardian reported on it and some, somebody leaked or recorded the whole Zoom meeting and it's, it plays on the internet and it only came online this week and over a million people have watched it already. And what happens in this is you get a beautiful example of people eating and devouring one another. They are criticising one another, it's chaotic. Uh, somebody says, well, I don't need to elaborate, I think you know the sorts of things that happen. Uh, remind us that there's, we can point score, we can put other people down, we can shout and raise our voice as if our voice was the one that needs to be heard. Or we can listen and there are other ways of communicating. So I'm not saying this because I, I know how to do it. I'm saying it because I'm learning some of this all the time. And it's a challenge to us to communicate in the right way, not to want to step up and make ourselves more important. So at the cross, where we enter the Christian church, we are one. We stand before God, united by our faith in our Saviour. It is he who brings us into the presence of God. What then are we to think about our words? Well, don't grumble. Jesus actually says this in John's Gospel, chapter 6. Don't grumble against one another. So what was happening in John chapter 6 was people were saying, how can this man give us the bread of heaven to eat? How can he give us his own body to eat? It was an interesting uh, and theological discussion, really. What was Jesus meaning? And some of them began to grumble or murmur among themselves about this. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. That's not the way to conduct a conversation, mumbling and alluding and whispering on the side. Jesus wants them to ask their questions, express them. If you look earlier in John's Gospel, you'll find Nicodemus and the woman of Samaria in chapter 3 and then chapter 4, both come with they, they ask questions of Jesus, and the, the dialogue is open for us. And that's what Jesus is asking for here. And in this particular case, in this passage, Jesus rebukes their grumbling and their murmuring. We should ask our questions, not sow discord. Jesus proceeds to be very clear about the point under discussion. He says, the work of God is to believe in the one he has sent. And he says the initiative here lies with God. We can't make ourselves believe. It requires the work of the Holy Spirit. Boys would sometimes say to me back in school days, are you trying to make us uh, believe uh, uh, the gospel, sir, or something like that, words along those lines, and say, boys, I can't make you believe. That's not my job. I can open up ideas for you to discuss and think about. I can show you things in the Bible. But you can't even make yourself believe. You have to be persuaded of it. And so this is what Jesus is saying here. He says the Father is drawing them. If our skepticism about the gospel is eroded, it's because the Holy Spirit is at work. God draws people to him. Jesus talks about this in chapter 6, verse 45. No one can come to me except the Father draws him to me. You can't put somebody's arm up their back and say, believe, believe. It's not like that. You need to be drawn with the cords of love of a Savior who reaches to you, whose arms are open wide and invites us to come freely. And if we have questions, we shouldn't be grumbling on the sidelines. We should ask them. We need to know and have our, our minds satisfied, be fully persuaded in our own minds. And so Paul says we need honest conversations. Don't lie to one another, says Paul, in the Colossian passage that I've connected to this point. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. The, this passage emphasizes the quality of communication that should characterize Christian believers. God has spoken. We have a God who speaks to us. The whole Bible is about that. God speaks to us and he speaks to us lovingly. It's been, the Bible has been described as a love letter from God. God is reaching to humanity. He's not wiping us away and uh, saying, well, I'm done with that lot. Not at all. No, he's rescuing and redeeming. That's God's purpose. And so if we start to 
tell lies to one another, we're not modelling ourselves on the God we say we serve. God has spoken truly, and the onus is on us to try and speak the truth. You know, there's an old saying, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. There is a lie. Jesus talks about the devil as the father of lies. The lie comes from the darkness. And we mustn't spread it. We must try and speak truth. And this is a challenge to us. This week I decided, because I was looking for something in the past mail, I I decided to look in my junk email folder. Now I had about 250 items in my junk email folder. So I didn't know, I had not seen them. They don't come to me, they go straight there if my computer detects that they're junk. In the 250 items, there was one item that I wanted that wasn't junk. It was misjudged by the computer. But everything else was junk. It was stuff that I didn't look for, didn't want, didn't ask for, but it came to me. And I thought there are a lot of people out there who are sending lies to us through our computer. I was being offered $500 uh, cash in a certain online casino. They give you money to spend so you can go to their casino because they know you're going to lose money there. That's how it works. And there were a lot of people offering me Bitcoin. This is an online currency. You might have heard about this other currency, cryptocurrency, or there's a whole lot of them. And and I was being offered a lot of money in currency which is not legal tender except on the internet. You've possibly heard about the dark web. Well, there are a lot of lies without going to the dark web. So as I as I deleted one item after another, just confirming and looking for this one I was looking for, uh, I discovered uh, it reiterated as I was thinking about what we were saying be saying today that that uh, the lie is ever present with us, and no media is exempt from the lie. You might recall because I have mentioned it once before, that not even the Bible is exempt here. Um, Sorry, I went backwards, not forwards. This is what's been called the the, uh, slave Bible. If you Google the slave Bible, you'll find out about this. This is the Holy Bible for the use of the Negro slaves in the British West India Islands. Actually, if you read carefully, you'll see it's select parts of the Bible for the use of slaves. And it was printed in 1807 in London. So who's printing this? Well, this is printed uh, by plantation owners. The select parts, what parts did they select? Well... They left out most of the Old Testament because there's so much in there about the slaves being set free. Left out the whole book of Exodus because that's about slaves being set free. They left out all the things about uh, walking uh, justly. And uh, in fact, they said it only concluded about 10% of the Old Testament. It left out uh, one of my favorite verses in the New Testament, Galatians 5 verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set you free. Stand fast then and do not be enslaved again with a yoke of bondage. Right? None of that for the slaves. So while the traders, uh, the plantation owners, just challenged by the date, 1807, the British Parliament passes the Emancipation of Slaves Act and uh, a British fleet is patrolling the West African coastline, West African coastline, uh, to make sure that no more British slaving is going on. And Britain spent a huge percentage, I've been told it was about 50% of the nation's budget, uh, securing the abolition of slavery. Uh, Of course, other nations were at that time still doing it. So what happened was the the owners of the, the cotton plantations and the sugar plantations and the tobacco plantations and the rice plantations in Virginia and other parts of the United States were growing wealthy and money was going back to... Glasgow. I went to Glasgow University, to a university in Glasgow. Apologies, Christine. Not Glasgow University. I went to Strathclyde, which is a technical university, I might say. 
And uh, Jamaica Street is one of the well-known streets in Glasgow. Why is there a street in a Scottish town called Jamaica Street? Because the wealth of so many of the people in Glasgow came from the West Indies, came from Jamaica, came from the plantations, the sugar barons and the tobacco barons. And they provided us a Bible for the slaves. But you see what's happening here. They're giving something that's true, but they're giving it in such a way as to mislead people. The slaves are not being given the truth. They're given part of the truth. And part of the truth may deceive. That means that it's not just truth that we're interested in, but it's speaking the truth in love. And that's what Amanda read to us from the letter to the Ephesians. What's the goal of our communication within the church? If we don't eat one another, if we don't grumble against one another, if we don't lie, what are we to say and, and how are we to say it and why? And the answer is that we're to speak truth to one another. To be like our Heavenly Father, we must be loving. Unlike God, we're not omnipotent. We don't know it all. And the truth is not necessarily at our fingertips or even in our heart. We need to learn the truth. We need to learn how to be truthful to one another. And this suggests that we should be cautious. We should be slow to speak, says James. Someone else has said God gave us two ears but only one mouth. So we should listen twice as much as we talk. And that might be a good advice. The truth in any given situation might not be self-evident. But we should seek it. And we should speak it with a particular intention. And that intention is to love and to build up the others with whom we share the life of the church. The truth cuts too. Like a surgeon's knife, sometimes we can be wounded by the truth. But when God wounds us, it's to heal us like a surgeon. And so we discover things about ourselves that we are uncomfortable with. Our own capacity to deceive, for example. Our own ignorance. And so we have to learn from one another, and especially from the Word of God. And we have it. When uh, Amanda came in this morning, she was looking for uh, a version that translated one or two of the words in a particular way, because it was easier to take in when you listen to it than the version she had been reading at home. And so it is, we have a multitude of versions. We have online versions. We have the access to the Bible in, in many ways. But we need to to take it on board, and we need to take it into our hearts and lives. The minute we think that we have the truth and are tempted to use it for ourselves, we, we often want to build up our own ego, and it's at that moment we realize we need a Savior, and we have one. In Jesus we have a Savior who's more concerned with us than with himself, more concerned with his Heavenly Father, who, whom he loved above all others, and with his neighbor. Remember the, the great commandment and the second is like unto it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. And who exemplified that? Who put that into practice at great personal cost? Well, it was Jesus. Motivated by that love, he has provided us with gospel truth. A truth that restores, that redeems, that reconciles us not only to God but to one another and brings rejoicing to our hearts. The wonderful returns of quality Christian communication. May that be true of us. May we communicate with each other, with one another, in that way. And so may God's word grow and uh, bring these rich fruits to our lives and keep us from deceit and lies. Amen. May God bless his word to us. Now I'm going to uh, lead in prayer. I invite you to uh, bow and uh, join with me as I articulate some prayers. So shall we join our hearts together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in love and mercy you have spoken truth to us and in the fullness of time revealed your truth 
in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word who became flesh and who dwelt among us. We have received your diagnosis of our deadly condition and thank you from the bottom of our hearts that there is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. We come to him who is the great physician and healer of our souls for the forgiveness and acceptance you so freely offer in his name. We confess that our words have not communicated to others the healing balm we so long to hear for ourselves. Forgive us that we have used words to hurt, to wound and to diminish others. Forgive us that we have used half-truths to bolster our own ego and to conceal our faults. As erring children, bring us again into the fold of the Saviour and restore to us the joy of your salvation. We are concerned at the rise of the coronavirus mutations, especially now so readily spread by aerosol. Guide our people of science in their exploration of the virus and enable them to continue to develop vaccines and therapies that will protect even the poorest of the Earth's people. We're grateful for the rollout of the vaccine in numerous countries and for the data this is providing on their effectiveness and we pray that the tide will turn on the pandemic and that especially the poorest nations will be well served by the World Health Organization and the COVAX agreement. Thank you for those who serve the Australian community in innumerable ways, police, ambos, fireys, the SES, as well as all who serve in a voluntary capacity. Protect all who serve and keep the community safe. We've been concerned about fires in WA and floods and are grateful that despite property damage, no lives have been lost. We're concerned about aspects of the anti-gay conversion bill passed by our state government on Thursday. We pray that concerns raised by lawyers and psychiatrists, as well as by people of faith, will yet be addressed. We have brought home to each, us, each day the terrible inhumanity of our species, the tyrannies of the Putin, Putin regime in Russia and political imprisonment of Alexei Navalny the continued abu abuse of the Uyghur people and others by the Chinese uh, Communist Party, the military tyranny in Myanmar and all such inhumanity. And we pray that you would raise up peacemakers around the world. Especially today we pray for the Democratic Republic of Congo. Please bring an end to the warfare that has for so long wreaked havoc, causing over 2,000 deaths and displacing a million people in a country with a population about that of Melbourne. Have mercy, Lord. We pray for those we know who are troubled with ill health and uncertainty about their future. Many of them elderly, but some are young. Help each and all whom we lift to you in the quiet of our hearts just now. And we ask, Lord, that you would follow with your blessing the proclamation of the gospel today, wherever Jesus is exalted. Speed the day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Encourage all who bear witness to his salvation. These things we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray together and say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Hymn 491 in Rejoice, I'm hoping, is this hymn, May the mind of Christ my Saviour dwell in me, from, live in me from day to day, by his love and power controlling. 
all I do and say. So just want you to notice the truthful speaking that this hymn calls for. Thank you, Sean. Amen, my. One more verse. Take it away, one more verse. said at the beginning that uh, there are dangers and pitfalls in the uh, in, in uh, speaking wrongly uh, deadly pitfalls and beautiful possibilities and one of those beautiful possibilities is that the beauty of the Lord our God would rest upon us and uh, I think some versions of this hymn have may his beauty rest upon me and I think that's a beautiful prayer that something of Christ will be seen in us in the week that lies ahead of us. Let us pray. Loving Father, we ask that the beauty of the Lord our God will be seen among us. And so may your grace, mercy and peace rest with each of us in all our homes and in our hearts. This week we pray. Amen.